When Ahab, that is the king, saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came near to all the people and said, how long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, then follow him. And the people did not answer him a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are, are 450 men. Let two bulls be given to us, and let them choose one bull for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. And all the people answered, it is well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first for you are many and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. And they took the bull that was given them and they prepared it and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O oh Baal, answer us. But there was no voice and no one answered. And they limped round the altar they had made. And at noon, Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is musing, or he is relieving himself, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is asleep and must be wakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. And all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench about the altar, as great as would contain two seahs of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and, and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. And Elijah said to them, seize the prophets of Baal, let not one of them escape. And they seized them. And Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and slaughtered them there. And Elijah said to Ahab, go up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of the rushing of rain. And Ahab went up to eat and to drink. And Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel and he bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, go up now, look towards the sea. And he went up and looked and said, there's nothing. 
And he said, go again, seven times. And at the seventh time, he said, behold, a, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, go up, say to Ahab, prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. And in a little while, the heavens grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. And Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. This is God's word, and we're thankful to him uh, for it. Let's pray uh, once more. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits. And in his word, I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. More than watchmen for the morning. Father, our, our hope is in you and in your word. So we ask that you would speak uh, now to us as we gather together as your people. And we ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, please, please open up your, your Bible again, uh, back to, to 1 Kings chapter 18, uh, the, the passage you read earlier. I'm sure you'll, you'll agree it's quite, a, quite an engaging uh, reading. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic story, really, of of heroes and villains, uh, of shouting and, and silence, uh, of fire and water. But, but all too often, I, I think, stories like this can seem very distant, very far removed from us, stories of, of sacrifice and, and miracles and, and bloodshed. Maybe there's, a, maybe there's a lesson or two for us to learn, but... More often than not, it's just a, a sigh of relief that, well, we don't, we don't live that way anymore, do we? But what I, what I want to tell you tonight is that God's Word is right up to date. It speaks of His Son on, on every page. And, and this story tonight, well, in a story of uh, crooked kings and powerful prophets, well, really, it's all about Jesus so before us tonight in 1 Kings chapter 18, it's really a, a divine jewel for the hearts of God's people. Two heavyweights are pitted off against each other on a firefight at the foot of Mount Carmel. This is a title bout that's going to take place over three rounds, and we have ringside tickets we're right up and close in the action. And I want you to join me as we go through each round together. So let's hear the bell ring for the start of round one, where we'll see a title claim. A title claim is made. In verse 18, Elijah, the, the faithful prophet of God, he confronts the, the wicked king Ahab with the charge of desertion. You have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now, as the, as the king of, of Israel, Ahab, well, he should have been a, an example of, of devotion and commitment to the Lord. In your Bible, that's, that's probably all caps, L-O-R-D, which means that in our, in our English translations, that means Yahweh. This is speaking of the God of, of promise, uh, the God of covenant, and that God, he had called for his kings to lead the people in obedience to him and in faithfulness to that covenant. But Ahab, well, Ahab, he's, he's the exact opposite of a faithful, obedient king. We're told just two chapters previously that well, Ahab, he had done more evil than all the kings who had come before him. He has forsaken the true God of Israel, and he's gone chasing after other gods. What, what does it say in verse 18? He's chased after the, the Baals, the Baals, plural. The plural there is probably reference to, to local forms of the one God, Baal, 
uh, that is worshipped throughout the land. This, this Baal is a, is a storm god uh, who lives in the clouds and rides on the lightning bolts. It's said that he brought rains to the people. And it's often the, the case throughout history well, where, the, where the king goes, there go the people. And so we, we read that as Ahab is himself going after Baal, so too are uh, the people of the land chasing after Baal in all his different local forms. But now it seems, well, the storm god, he's, he's dried up and he's gone home. Because there's not been rain in the land for three years because Elijah, Elijah, that faithful prophet, he, he has called down the covenant curse of Deuteronomy chapter 11, that covenant curse for chasing after other gods. But now the, well, the, time, the time finally comes for, for Elijah to, to confront the king for his wickedness and well, he's really, he's going to show the people who's really in charge. And so the arena for this title match is, is chosen. It's, it's not Hamden Park. It's not Madison Square Garden. But they choose the, the foot of Mount Carmel. And King Ahab, he, he calls all the false prophets and representatives of the people together. And the challenge is laid down in verse 21. Look, look at verse 21 with me. How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. It's quite the moment, isn't it? Elijah makes it perfectly clear there can only be one undisputed champion. There's only one who is worth following. There is only one God. What do you make of that, that word, by the way, that is used to describe how Israel are, are going between gods? Do you see that word there, limping? They're hobbling back and forward to and fro from Yahweh to Baal, from, from Baal to, to Yahweh. I have no doubt this is caused it partly by indecision or, or confusion, perhaps, on, on the behalf of the people. I mean, they're, imagine the conversation at, at dinner time. Well, the king, he, well, he follows Baal. But our, our forefathers, well, they, they followed Yahweh. So, well, who should we follow? I'm sure, I'm sure that confusion is, is part of it. But I think there might be more to it than that as well. Could it be that the people, perhaps the people are they're trying to have it both ways? They're trying to serve two masters. They want to, they want to avoid the, the wrath of the king Ahab, who, well, they know he's killed thousands of followers of Yahweh, so they worship Baal. But they remember they're the God of their forefathers who had never forsaken them, who had blessed them in so many ways and, and even had led them into the land in which they now dwell. And so they, they worship Yahweh. And so they amble back and forth, picking and, and choosing what suits them. But Elijah, however, Elijah, he isn't, he isn't pulling any punches in this title match. Choose who you will follow one or the other. This is a sort of a you can't have your cake and eat it sort of moment. But, but Israel, well, they want to embrace the, the, the spirit of a, well, a former prime minister of ours who said, well, my policy on cake, I'm pro-having it and pro-eating it. But when it comes to us, Tonight, when it, when it comes to our, our hearts, when it comes to our worship, when it comes to our devotion, we cannot have it both ways. Our Lord Jesus, he, he taught us that too, didn't he? 
you cannot serve two masters for you will what? You will hate one and love the other. You will, you will cling tightly to one and you will, you will despise and, and reject the other. As you, as you sit here tonight, I, I could be wrong, but I suspect you're not tempted to worship Baal. I mean, the application's, the application is clear, isn't it? You cannot worship multiple deities. You cannot worship Yahweh and Allah. You cannot serve our God and Vishnu or, or Brahma. No, I suspect you're, you're not tempted to worship Baal. But perhaps you are tempted to serve two masters. So what, what, what might that look like uh, for us uh, in our lives? Maybe, maybe it's to do with our relationship to material things, to our, our possessions. Maybe your, your mind is filled with thoughts of money while also claiming to be a servant of God. Now let me tell you, that money is not a, a bad thing. Caring for your family is not a bad thing. Enjoying God's creation is not a, a bad thing. But of all that, that fills your mind day and night is interest rates and inflation. Well, then you cannot enjoy the full blessing that, that God has to, to offer you. But maybe it's, not, maybe it's not money for you. Maybe, maybe your heart is divided over the way that you, you speak, how you speak to other people, maybe when you're, when you're not around uh, other Christians, perhaps. On a, on a Sunday, you're, you're here, you're, you're singing uh, the praises of, of God with his people. But during the week, maybe, maybe in the workplace, maybe at, maybe at school, your, your language among the people around you, it's, it's coarse, it's crude, it's slanderous. You're, it's filled with, with innuendo. The same fountain cannot produce sweet water and bitter. You cannot have a divided heart when it comes to what comes out of your mouth. Maybe it's more about what you're listening to. From, from one week to another, you, you sing tonight, you sing how sweet the name of, of Jesus sounds. And yet from one week to, to another, you, you don't listen to his words. Your ears are filled with 24-hour news or, or podcasts or crass music. For Elijah, there's no caveats. For our Lord Jesus, there are no caveats. The reality of a divided heart is that you will, you will love one master and you will, you will hate the other. So I'll repeat the, the question that, that Elijah presents us tonight. How, how long will you go halting, limping between two opinions? How long will you try to serve two masters? Choose, choose tonight who you will serve. So round one comes to an end with a title claim. And verse 24, verse 24, it shows us that, well, this, this matchup is going to be a fire fight. Two altars are to be built, a sacrifice offered, and whichever, whichever God answers by fire, well, they are the true God. And so the rules are laid out, and the bell rings, for the start of round two, where we see a faltering foe, a faltering foe. So the prophets of Baal, well, they're, they're invited to, to go first in this contest. They, they choose the, the bull uh, that they want, and they're given the opportunity to, to produce uh, results, to produce a fire. So how do they, how do they go about doing this? What, what do they do? Well, they call out to their God, and what does verse 26 tell us about how they, they do this? They, they call out to the name of Baal morning until noon. Can you imagine the noise? The passage tells us there's, 
There's 450 prophets of Baal present. And even if you take it that they didn't all take part in the, the sacrifice, to have that sound, oh Baal, answer us, answer us for hours on end, it must have been awful. And on and on they cry, and yet the result is, is the same from nine o'clock to 12 o'clock. There is no voice, and no one answers. Did you, did you notice a word that we, we've seen already in this passage as well, cropped up again in verse 26? What are, the, what are the prophets doing while they're crying out for answers? What are they up to? They're limping around the altar, limping around, hobbling along, ju- just like the people of Israel have been doing. See, the, the, the people and the prophets, well, really, they're, they're one and the same. Those who, who worship Baal, really, they're, they're just the same as those who lead the worship of Baal. They are, they're unsteady. They're, they're stumbling. They're staggering as they go along. And, well, our prophet Elijah, well, he's just taking it all in. And he sees this moment now after hours upon hours of silence he sees this as his chance to, to speak up. They say that sarcasm is the lowest form of wit. But for our prophet here, well, it's really it's the highest form of intelligence. Elijah, he, he knows the, the myths about Baal. He knows the stories of him going out to war, of him going out traveling, of him going to sleep. So he uses these stories. He he takes these stories about Baal that the prophets would have been familiar with and and he uses them against them. And it works. They redouble their efforts and they begin they begin self mutilating in an attempt to get Baal's attention. They they cry out all the louder. And they become, they become incoherent as they rave on into the afternoon. And surely now us sitting here, we, you can't help but feel a sense of, of, of pity at the scene. Some sadness of, of what's going on here. I mean, hours and hours of, of shouting and, and limping and, and dancing and, and cutting and, and, and lacerating it. It's, it's, it makes a sorrowful sight. And in this context, in the midst of all of this noise and ceremony, the end of verse, verse 29 is absolutely devastating. There was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Their cries for an answer they're met with silence. They were no doubt zealous. They were certainly sincere. But the truth is there, there is, there is no answer. There, there's no voice. Not because, not because Baal is, is busy. Not because Baal's off at war. Not because he's sleeping. Baal does not answer because Baal, well, Baal isn't God. In this divine duel for the hearts of God's people, Baal, well, Baal finds himself faltering and staggering. He's reeling. He's limping, just like the people and just like the prophets. And it's not just, that, it's not just the limping that's paralleled that, that we have in this passage. Look, look back again. Look at verse 22 with me. After Elijah, he, he, he's issued the challenge to the people, and the people haven't answered him a word. And now that the challenge is underway, the God that the people have, have chased after, well, he, he proves himself to be just like them, silent, mute, unable to to answer the challenge. 
And I think our world is a world full of people crying out for, for answers. People are full of questions. The CU events week this week will hope to answer some of those questions, looking at hope that we can have in Jesus. But it's not just, it's not just me up the front saying this. It's not just the, the CU guys that are saying this. I, th- I think someone that really nails this on the head, it's not, it's not John Calvin. It's not Billy Graham. It's Billy Eilish. Do you know who Billy Eilish is? There's some blank faces in the room. Billie Eilish, she's a singer-songwriter. One of, the, one of the biggest songs of last year it was, was written by her. Maybe you know it. It was entitled, What Was I Made For? The repeated refrain of that song asks that question over and over again. What was I made for? What was I made for? And no, no answer comes to that question. There's just, there's just silence. The question just hangs in the air. Now, now Billie Eilish, the, the, the writer of that song, she, she was worried that the song might not do very well, that people wouldn't, wouldn't understand it, wouldn't get it. But clearly that song has resonated with, with millions of people. Because it won a Grammy last week. People are asking these questions. People are asking, what, what was I made for? And the culture it seeks to give answers to these questions, but we just end up, just end up drawing blanks. What was I made for? Why, why am I here? Will there, ever be, will there ever be justice? Does anyone actually care out there? Let me tell you tonight, it, it's good to ask those questions. It's a good instinct within you that, that is looking for, for answers to these kinds of questions. But I, hope, I want you to see tonight that asking the wrong people, going to the wrong sources of information, it will just end with silence. And that silence is, is crushing. It just, it just forces us it just forces us inward. We, we just look inside for answers, but, but you and I know when we, when we look inside, we, we seldom find answers. We just find more questions. So let me encourage you tonight. Bring your questions to God. Bring your questions to Yahweh, to the Bible. Speak to God in, in prayer. Speak, speak to a Christian that you know someone that's brought you here, speak to me. Speak to God and he will hear you and he will begin to answer some of the questions that you are asking. Tonight for you, tonight it could be the end of the sound of silence. It could be the beginning of the sound of a joyous hope. Well, are you ready for round three? Round one, we saw the title claim being made. Round two, we have our faltering foe. And and the finale of round three, we have a knockout blow. A knockout blow. This this final round, well, it gets off to a bit of a slow start, doesn't it? Elijah, he's, he's certainly intentional and methodical as he goes about the business of preparing an altar. For sacrifice. Did you notice what it says about that altar in verse 30? Is this, is, this a, is this a brand spanking new altar? Has Elijah been concocting some new design that he wants to show off to, to the people of Israel? Well, no, this is, this is less grand designs and a bit more DIY SOS, something old that needs a bit of repair rather than something new that needs building up. And like any good designer, any good architect, every, every decision, it comes with, with purpose, it comes with meaning. So look at some of the features of this altar before you. There's 12 stones represent the 12 tribes of Israel and the unity that exists in the people, even though at this present time that the kingdom is split 
north and south. There's a, there's a quotation in verse 31. Israel shall be your name. That's from Genesis 35, showing that, that these are God's chosen people to whom he has been faithful for generations. And the trench that's built around it, well, that will only further serve to underline the power of God, which we will see in a moment. The 12 stones, the, the Torah citation, the, the trench surrounding, these are all intentional design decisions. And now the bull is prepared, and now we think, right, let's get down to business, let's get into the action, let's, let's see what, what God can really do. But Elijah isn't finished yet in his preparation. Things are about to get wet, wet, wet. Four jars of water, filled and emptied, filled and emptied, filled and emptied. I mean, it's, it's almost laborious in the reading, but the, the meaning is clear that the, this, altar, this altar is dripping with water. The wood is saturated. More than three gallons or 15 liters of water fill the trench and flood the offering. And in a time of, of three years of drought, such, such liberal usage of water, possibly from, from the Mediterranean or from a nearby spring, such liberal usage of water, surely that, that raises the stakes a bit here. But much more to the point, I mean, by, by soaking this, this sacrifice with, with water, when, when the winner of this contest is supposed to do, produce fire, I mean, Elijah, he's, he's, he's playing with a man in the sin bin here. He's, he's boxing with an arm tied behind his back. All the odds are, are stacked against him. And Elijah, well, he, he's making it perfectly clear that, that any intervention, any fire that comes, well, it's not from a box of matches that he's hidden under his robe. Surely it must be an act of God if fire is to come. And so having, having taken the time to prepare the altar, the, the time for the evening offering draws near, the offering of oblation in some translations. So Elijah steps forward before the crowds. I'm trying to enter into the, the mindset of the, of the crowds for a moment. They, they've been standing here for, for hours. <laughs> they've been watching dozens and dozens of prophets shouting, dancing, there's been a spectacle to observe and, and nothing to show for it. And now Elijah steps up, so what, what's he going to do? How's he going to bring the fire of Yahweh? There's no, there's no shouting. There's no marching or dancing. No self-inflicted injuries are needed. He simply offers a prayer. Now the prayer of verse 36 and 37, well, we, could, we could pitch our tent and camp out here the rest of the evening. I mean, it really is amazing. I mean, look, look, look at the history that, that Elijah claims in the opening sentence, like all the names he uses. And see as well later on that the trust that Elijah has in the power of God, that, that God will perform this miracle. And also you see his confidence in the sovereign reign that God has over his people against that of King Ahab. But that's not what we'll, we'll focus on. The moment the prayer comes to an end, the moment as a word, Elijah says, amen. Fire falls from heaven. A great furnace of God burns the offering to a crisp. The wood is evaporated. The, the stone and the dust, they, they can't withstand it. And, and the water, that very, that very item for dousing a flame, well, the water, it, it cannot withstand the heavenly heat wave that is poured out upon this altar. The fire is all-consuming. And the winner, well, is undisputed. All the offering is burnt up. 
all the people bow down in praise of the one true God. And all the prophets of Baal are brought to justice. The laws of the Old Testament, Israel, they, they called for, for false prophets and, and idolaters to be put to death. For you see, these false prophets had led thousands of God's people astray and had led them into death through idol worship and, and drought. And the Lord, well, he answers their drought in the closing verses of this chapter. I mean, there's long-awaited rain. A cloud appears on the horizon, and the drought is over. That whole section, the whole paragraph, it's, it's worthy of a sermon on its own. You'll be glad to know I'm not going to do that just now. No, we can't, we can't focus there. We can't focus on the sign of the cloud. We can't, we can't focus on even Elijah's prayer. No, I want us tonight as we close, I want us to focus on really the, the center point of, of this event, the thing this, this event revolves around. It's that, that sacrifice that's offered on the altar. Please, please stick with me in this. See, in, in Israel, there were perpetual sacrifices, repeated offerings of the temple system. They all they were all designed to point forward to, to something better. And yes, this, this sacrifice that we looked at, this, this is something amazing. I mean, this really is a, a display of, of God's power and, and his majesty. But it would, it would only be a matter of days before another sacrifice was needed, another bull to be slaughtered, another, another goat to be offered up. See, this, this sacrifice, yeah, yes, of course it was special, but really it, it foreshadows, just like the offerings of the temple system, it, it foreshadows a, a better offering, a greater sacrifice that would be made not, not at Mount Carmel, but at Mount Calvary. See, on the cross, our, our Lord Jesus, he he offered himself a sacrifice. He offered himself to the fires of God's wrath against sin, to save a people for himself. Our Lord Jesus, he, he was not like us with our divided hearts, but he was fixed on the will of the Father to redeem a people for himself. He was not on that cross given answers when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? He received no answers. He hung there in silence. He was alone. He was forsaken. He experienced an unanswered prayer that he had, ever, he had never known. But he did that for us. He did that so that, so that we would never be forsaken, so that we would never be alone, separated from God. He bore the flames of the Father's indignation against sin. But unlike the sacrifice tonight, he, he was not consumed. Oh, he certainly died. A spear was pierced in his side. He was buried in a, in a tomb it was sealed with a stone. It was guarded by Roman soldiers for our Lord. Well, the odds, the odds were stacked against him. And yet he rose, he rose triumphant over, over death, over, over sin. He defeats sin and the devil. And now he shows us the future that awaits us if we trust in him. It's not a future of rain. It's a future of resurrection. And so tonight, have you been left in, in silence with your questions? Do you see in your heart a division? Look with me then, not to the cloud, but to the empty tomb. You will find there a risen Savior 
who's risen for your salvation. Look to the Savior tonight. He can change your heart in love. And you'll find in him, you'll find full assurance and full salvation. Praise his glorious name. Let's pray to him now.